Well, hello everyone and welcome here to the Launchpad and welcome to Space Engine Systems here in Alberta, Canada and their design and assembly turbo ramjet engine shop. We're going to take you inside to get a look at their turbo ramjet engine development facility and sit down with Pradeep Das, the president and CTO of Space Engine Systems. Let's head on inside. To get us started, maybe for those that maybe have not heard of Space Engine Systems, could you share a little bit about the mission of Space Engine System? Uh, Space Engine System was set up in uh, 2011. Uh, the focus was always Luna mission. Everything else we are doing is to bring in cash flow. Mm -hmm. Hypersonic, going to Leo, suborbital, uh, anything else. Uh, we're basically a trucking company to anywhere in space. Uh, including the Luna mission. It's also space. I think we'll take some time and take a quick look at an engine, but yeah, uh, yeah just thank you so much for okay. letting us come in and thank share you. more of your story. It's, uh, it's, there's not a lot known, and you guys are working on some really incredible stuff, so I yeah. appreciate your time. Um, anytime, you're welcome, and also thanks for having us. Can you m maybe just walk me through the actual jet of the engine itself, what we're looking okay, at? Okay, so um, I'll just stand here and explain. Okay. So we have, these are uh, turbo ramjet engines. Uh, it's a turbine with a ramjet, which will be connected to that. It's basically an afterburner converted into a ramjet and put together. So there's a heat exchanger, which is not here. It is on the front of this. And that will cool the air getting into this combustor. I mean, sort of compressor. And then after that, it goes into a combustion and then turbine and out. So it's got, like I said, it's got a 5,500 seconds of uh, ISP at ground sea level. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a ramjet, uh, which is a combination of an afterburner and a ramjet, uh, it uses hydrogen, which has become gaseous, and that's what uh, it, it does. So even at higher levels, we still have high ISP because the ramjet is also working at that time. Usually no one puts in heat into the ramjet at subsonic because it doesn't put out much thrust, but the heat is beneficial to us. So the transition is very smooth compared to all the turbo ramjet companies who are working. They wait till the turbine is almost done and then the ramjet kicks in. For us, the ramjet actually fires up way before the turbine is off. So at, even at less at subsonic speeds and just about supersonic speed, the ramjet is already working. So the transition is almost, by the time the turbine engine is completely dead, uh, the afterburner is fully operational. So there's no transition of, you know, stop and take off. That is a transition is a big thing. So you don't want to stop and then put more uh, thrust into it. That, that's how this one works. Okay. For Hello 1 and 2, is it a single engine is the plan for each? Uh, for or? the Hello 1X, it's a single engine. Actually, one of the, I mean, uh, the engine that is running is not here. Right. These are destructions. Uh, okay. So we destruct these engines uh, to see everything that is happening, including fatigue. No one right. can fail, so it doesn't. Yeah, so, and the, the, and the other engine is the final one we put together and integrate with the vehicle. So the Hello 1X has got only one. Hello 2 will have a minimum of two engines, but it depends on which one will get the highest thrust. Uh, and we could have up to four. But we didn't start building the Hello One yet. It's Hello One X is what we're building right now. It'll have only one uh, turbo ramjet engine. And that is final. Right. All right, there's no change in that part. Okay. So we put together, and most of the parts you see in this is picked up from different engines and then put together by us. It's not like uh, we went and uh, asked someone GE or someone to design an engine for us. Right. So we make our own engine, we make our own airframe, uh, we test the airframe, we test the engine. I think in the world, we are the only company uh, in the world with high thrust turbine engines with mobile facilities. So we can take this test facility anywhere for testing. So the whole test facility is in a couple of containers. Okay. So we can move it anywhere for mobile testing. Why the moon? Um, you see, we want to have a business case. Uh, we think that um, launch will not bring us money in the next five to eight years. I mean, positive cash flow. I'm not talking about cash flow. Right. So we think that uh, in 2011 itself, our plan was to displace rockets. And, uh, and this is the way that I thought that we could do it and being the lowest cost. So um, I should not be saying, I mean, uh, the space station, which everyone thinks is a good idea. I always thought that 
we should have gone to moon right then and there and probably build, build over there. It's just one-sixth the gravity. Uh, it would have been easier, but the world decided to go with space station and Mars space station was there before that. And I was following the Russian uh, technologies during that time. So I think everyone followed what Russia did and uh, made the space station. I, I would have hoped that everyone would have gone to the moon at that time, although we did it some, I mean, not we, the U.S., it did it some 50-something years ago, and we are talking as a big thing today. It's, it's really bad. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, quite a delay of actually getting to go back. Um, I mean, just imagine just... a car of 55 years old, you try to open it up. Uh, of course, you'll see some unique stuff. Uh, look at how technology has changed from that time to now. Absolutely. If you put in the resources at that time, things would have been uh, great, I think. Yeah. This is my view. But, uh, Never know what we would have been able to invent and discover by having to exactly. be there Exactly. I mean, I tell everyone, some people who ask me, uh, what do you, you spend all this money in space, what do you gain? I mean, of course, you can see the cell phones and others. But if you see that battery pack drilling machine that you use in your house, that was invented for the lunar mission to drill up all that sand from there. Right. So they need a battery pack. I mean, now it's like any home might have it. But 55-something years ago, or 50-something years ago, it was unheard of, right? So th these are some simple things that if entered your house, you just don't know, right? right? Absolutely. Why focus on something like a space plane, horizontal takeoff and landing, then, and a traditional rocket? Okay. Uh, that's the base of the company. If we cannot be the lowest cost to space, then we are just another company. Uh, if you look at the ISP, and I have to go a bit technically, a specific impulse, as you probably might know. Uh, if you look at the liquid hydrogen versus oxygen, probably it'll give you close to about 380 to 420 seconds as ISP, that being the best. And if you go and look at others, uh, any of the uh, Falcon 9s or any of those engines, it'll all probably come down to 350. Some will go down to even as low as 250 seconds. We got 5,500 seconds using an air breathing engine at sea level. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see the difference right away, but no one in turbine engine will talk in terms of ISP. But we, they would talk thrust versus mass or weight. But we would talk in ISP so the rocket companies can understand what we're talking about, or space companies. So we got 5,500 seconds, and we go up to 32 kilometers altitude. That's a turbo ramjet, all right? So, the reason why we are not doing scramjet is because it's not ready yet. I mean, it might take a few years before scramjet is ready. Scramjet would put you up to 70 kilometers. But turbo ramjet is a proven technology. Uh, people have tested it, people have done it, and how you do it differently is what matters. So we put together a whole bunch of engines, uh, parts from off-the-shelf engines, and put the whole thing together, fix a ramjet into it, and uh, we get up to 32 kilometers altitude. And up, the thing is that getting to 32 kilometers is where you save money. Mm -hmm. From 32 kilometers is a rocket engine that is going to kick in and take us to suborbital. And from suborbital, we have a transfer vehicle going up to LEO if, if you want to go to LEO or any, any of those things. Mm -hmm. So if you take, uh, I would probably cite SpaceX being one of the best companies that I see. And uh, no, they call it, reusable. So if you look at that, they've taken probably liquid nitrogen, they've taken fuel, they've taken oxygen to bring the whole thing back. Mm -hmm. And that's a penalty going up and that's a penalty coming down. Mm -hmm. We just glide back like a shuttle. Mm -hmm. The penalty we have is the wings and the frame. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have mitigated. So if you look at the uh, Falcon 9 um, the reusable Falcon 9. Yeah. Uh, I think um, the mass payload fraction is about 2%. Mm -hmm. Our payload fraction is somewhere between 4.9 to 5.1%. Mm -hmm. So you can really see the advantage right away. And mm -hmm. that's where it is. Absolutely. Looking at the, the turbo ramjets, um, talking about engine performance and spacecraft capability, how does it compare to even just a typical uh, engine, you were saying you were kind of taking off the part shelves and then modifying. How's that uh, advance that technology? Okay, so if you look at a regular turbine engine, it goes up to about, if you, were, if you flew in from the U.S., you probably would have gone maximum altitude of 13.1 kilometers. Uh, 
I mean, that is probably the maximum most of the commercial planes would fly. So uh, if you go above it and if you go above Mark 1, I mean, there are planes that go above Mark 1, but you, you should ask them how long they fly. So, so what happens is the engine gets heated up. Uh, the compressors of the turbine engine will not work because you need to keep it cool to compress. Anything which is hot, the molecules are far apart it's difficult to compress or there's no compression efficiency. So what we do, the most critical technology we have, although we have all the other things, is the heat exchanger. So we got a heat exchanger right in front of a turbine engine, cooling it. And it's using liquid hydrogen. So we had to make our own, probably the first company in the world that has got a liquid hydrogen tank inside the vehicle. And that can be used, we were thinking of spinning it off for the auto industry and others, because if you were to uh, compress gaseous hydrogen uh, at 10,000 PSI, it still can hold only so much. We don't need to compress it. A thousand times more by keeping liquid hydrogen in, uh, in volume. Once it becomes gaseous, it becomes thousand, approximately a thousand times more in volume. Uh -huh. So we use the liquid hydrogen minus 253, cool the heat exchanger, and cool the air getting in uh, in about eight milliseconds, uh, take away close to about 10 megawatts uh, approximately. And that fuel, it becomes fuel then, and then we showed it out to a ramjet. So initially it's going to run on jet A fuel, just like any other plane. We can, we can run on multiple fuels, but to make it simple for the first one, we're just going to run on jet A fuel, uh, liquid hydrogen. And the rocket engine for the Hello One it will have a kerosene mix uh, for the rocket engine. So we don't need any extra tanks or anything like that. We can figure all that out. What are some of the other propellants you think you could switch to after the jet fuel? Well, after, after jet fuel and after hydrogen, I mean, hydrogen, the reason we're using hydrogen, hydrogen is not a good fuel in terms of volume. It's good fuel in terms of weight, right? Uh, but the thing is that we already got this cooling coming out of the seat exchange. It's already become gaseous. So we're just using it. And then after that, we can do it various grades of RP uh, once in, in, instead of um, hydrogen again to go up there. So we would probably not use hydrogen for the rocket fuel. Okay. So the rocket is the only thing that we, the rocket engine is the only thing we are not manufacturing. Okay. Everything else other than the standard computer or this desk sitting here we manufacture in-house. Absolutely. Why is manufacturing in-house so important? Uh, it's one of those most critical things. Everyone thinks that design um, is the most important thing. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with design. You've got to come out with design. Uh, you need to make sure it works. But if you don't know how to manufacture, because you're making it for the first time, mm -hmm. you're going to scrap it. Uh, we are probably one of the best companies for scrapping. I think we have learned by scrapping. So we are very good at failures more than success. <laughs> what has that kind of journey to where you're at now been like? What, what kind of failures have you seen that maybe you weren't expecting? Everywhere. I, mean, I, I would say that I, I'd like to be as positive as I can, but there's something in me that keeps telling me, how many failures can you sustain mm. before you run out of money? It's all about uh, bankruptcy. So I, I tell my guys, we've got a thing called a single cup rule. I, mean, I just came up one day and just to put it into every engineer's head, how they should think. I said, you go to a shop to buy a coffee mug and you want only one coffee mug. And you go there and the guy says, one dollar for one coffee mug, one dollar, one cent for the second coffee mug. I said, leave that one cent there. We need that one cent. Buy one coffee mug. We can pay ten dollars tomorrow and buy a second cup. But bankruptcy happens on the cutoff date. So we need that one cent. Don't buy the second cup. So you won't see a lot of unnecessary stuff around, but still I tell them, we are going to scrap it, like for the wings of the vehicle. We are making the actual wings of the vehicle and simultaneously we are testing uh, the vehicle. We have not tested it yet, but that means that we could scrap the other two wings or we have to strengthen it more. So it's a very bad system, uh, we totally understand that. But if not, it'll be like 15, 20 years before we do anything. So we are aggressive and uh, planning on failures. 
right? right. To, to innovate aggressively, you have to plan on those failures, but be aware of how much you have. We've seen that just happen with Virgin Orbit. They, a $10 part on a rocket ended up to kind of the snowball of the downfall of Virgin Orbit. So Yeah, um, well, I mean, I'm not an expert in what happened to Virgin Orbit. I think it is payroll. So you've got to be careful uh, when you bring in all those high-flying guys who have got a lot of experience in it. Um, because you want them there because you want to raise a lot of money. You're a public company. I'm just talking, it, perhaps because of that, I have no idea yeah. what happened actually. Um, it's a bad thing. So here what we do is we keep it as lean, lean as possible. And we don't have any big time guys uh, from any company working here, uh, none whatsoever. So, because they cannot change their ways. If I bring in guys, from, I don't have name companies, but I've tried in the early days to bring in guys with a lot of experience. Everything they come up with, they would say, well, this is how we did it there. That kills the whole thing. I mean, everyone just follows it. The average age of this company's uh, personnel is about 33 years. That's because I'm old, right? So that's where the, uh, or a couple of other people, uh, in, all younger than me though, but 33 is the average age of the company, uh, personal here. So we got fresh engineers coming in and getting in. Uh, they do a wonderful job. I mean, I can't even imagine the amount of work they put into it and how fast they do things. And they're open to ideas, right? I mean, that's the biggest thing. And uh, one, of the th one of the biggest challenges we have is perfecting manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Looking at the, the manufacturing process and doing everything in-house, are you finding you have to make a lot of custom tooling or parts to actually be able to do your manufacturing, or is it mostly off the shelf? Uh, we try to do, if we can go to uh, Home Depot and pick up something, we'll try to do it. So I tell them we don't need aerospace certification for anything that does not fly. It's ground, we do ground testing, right? So you don't get an aerospace wire tag to hold, just get a big wire rope and then tie it down. But it is true, I mean, but we make our own tool and die. Uh, we won't make our own fixtures. So every engineer here, I don't want to say everyone, most of the engineers here are very hands-on. So they do that. And we also have our own CFD for CFD analysis. Uh, we build it by ourselves. We have even published some papers on it. But we are not a big paper publishing company and uh, we don't follow. And we have stayed away from any patents. Uh, we got a couple of patents, but the main thing is that we're not selling a vehicle. We're just a trucking company. So when we start selling the vehicle, we look at uh, applying for patents. Right now, uh, we try to put it, everything in the open as much as possible. So we don't get sued by someone else saying, oh, we got a patent for that, right? So, so it's all documented. We know exactly. We also AS9100 certified. So we do our risk mitigation very closely. But again, I'll always come back to one thing. How many failures can we sustain? So. <laughs> Absolutely. So talking about looking at it like a trucking company, is the plan then to exclusively just get contracts to take people's payload and not ever sell the vehicle? Well, maybe not ever sell the vehicle, but that's not priority one. Uh, pr priority one, exactly. I mean, the priority one right now is just be a trucking company to space. Of course, it's got wheels, but uh, but the vehicle comes back. Right. And, and being the lowest cost. I mean, I tell them we don't have to follow any other company. We just got to beat one company. And that's the most difficult, SpaceX. That's the only company we have to beat in cost. Right now, SpaceX has got cost and, I mean, cost, I don't think anyone is comparing. They got reliability. What do we have? Nothing in reliability. So until we fly, uh, I don't want to say it's all BS, but that's what it is, right? So we got to fly. It's all talk until then. Right. So how can we fly fast is the only focus that we have. Do you have a target kind of price range, obviously being better than SpaceX per kilogram? Do you you have a goal that you're trying to hit or is it see what we have to build first and then I, I can tell you in terms of uh, what should I say payload fraction mm -hmm. if I tell you in terms of dollars I may be totally wrong right because I really don't know uh, what they're proposing I mean I have seen uh, numbers using payload fraction we are about five percent mm -hmm. so that should give you an idea mm -hmm. how inexpensive we should be compared to the best rocket. Uh, let's take, let's say Starship. That's about two percent or one point eight percent, because they're not 
if they try to reuse it, it it's quite a bit yeah. right so you just throw a rock up and try to bring it down slowly and make it land that'll give you an idea how much energy you have to take from ground the fuel the the the, the propellant yeah. the oxygen uh, doesn't matter if it's solid and the liquid nitrogen or something to control it and then bring it over water and bring it uh, and land on land beautiful it looks beautiful it's wonderful I mean, I'm, they made it work um, excellent but don't say that is the cheapest way it's reusable to a third person compared to another rocket mm -hmm. but it cannot be free like a shuttle coming down I don't have to prove this will fly down uh, and just glide down and land we can even have touch and go if we leave some fuel if not it'll just glide down and land it's exactly like a shuttle mm -hmm. it's got no cost at all for us What's the amount of flight time? You were saying the, the amount of seconds, but uh, after you deploy a payload, is it something that could, you know, we take off from here in Edmonton and we're landing in Calgary, or are we talking, you know, launch and landing operations are going to be at one facility? Okay, so basically uh, point to point is what you're talking about. Right. So we, if you can take off from one location, uh, you can land in any other location close by. So our flight time is about seven minutes com complete. Okay. Uh, to go there and just come down, okay. right? But if you want to s stay on suborbital, that add another four minutes uh, for suborbital. Four to five minutes is what you'll get suborbital if someone wants to go on a suborbital flight, right? I mean, just like what Blue Origin is doing or anyone else or Virgin. I think Virgin Orbit, it shows a longer period. I think they are flying around quite a bit before they release it, so that is why the time is longer. But the suborbital time, I think most companies in ours will be the same, and because the physics does not change, right? So. Is that something you guys want to get into eventually? Absolutely, we're already selling uh, tickets on our website. Oh. Um, you may have missed it, but uh, it's already there. So, But that's for 2025. Okay. Uh, but we want to send payloads uh, up uh, from next year onwards, and subject to FAA approval. Right. By the way, we're not planning to fly from Canada, we applied in 2021 uh, to fly from Lynn Lake to Transport Canada. Right. Uh, that was with, uh, at that time, a sex bomb uh, and one of those questions that you had. And um, that was a drone. And the purpose of that is to see how we can do Mark V by releasing it from another vehicle or from a balloon. Right. It's got only a ramjet. It does not have a turbo ramjet. So it cannot take off by itself. You've got to have some means of throwing it up there right. and picking up some kind of speed uh, to do it. But uh, we realize that we will never get approval in Canada. Yeah. Uh, things would have changed um, now, but that was in 2021. So we scavenged all that out, uh, took all the parts out of that. And uh, that is available for anyone uh, if the defense wants it. Uh, it's available, but we go, also got a turbo ramjet. We can do smaller ones with turbo ramjet based on a Hello One X already. Right. So we are very focused on defense. All this again is to bring in money. Right. So we we really don't think in the next five years we'll make money from launch. When I mean make money, means positive cash flow. We won't have it. So all this defense and other areas is critical for us to sustain the failures that we are planning. <laughs> Right. How has it been navigating working with the Canadian government, the U.S. government? You're also working with the U.K. throughout of Cornwall. How is navigating not just one but three governments' regulations and testing policies, and then even flight policy? Um, in terms of Canadian government, we, we have just met with them, uh, applied to Transport Canada. We have nothing happening in Canada, except everything was developed here. I mean, right here in Edmonton, uh, between Villeneuve and here. I mean, Exactly, but nothing is happening with the Canadian government and us. But we are uh, following them, and I hope we'll get some kind of support from Canada. Uh, I don't think that uh, other than one or two engineers of minor support, uh, we have no other big support from Canada, uh, either from Canadian Space Agency from, or Canadian government. But I think things are changing. I'm hoping that things would change. Why should we move to the U.S. otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, we have looked at defense in Canada, but it did not go anywhere. So we, we are focused, so we set up a company in the U.S. called Space Engine Systems, USA Inc. So it's going to be a standalone company. And we're going to set up four locations in the U.S. And uh, there are six or seven states uh, bidding with us uh, to take, I, I think, eight uh, bidding with us for those four locations. Uh, and the four locations, the reason why we're setting up four locations is some are just for launch and ground. Some are only for ground testing. The aim is to keep critical engineers at their locations. So there could be one critical engineer in one area that we want, but he or she may not be willing to move to a different location. So we split the U.S. into four areas, and we're going to set it up in four locations. So it'll have, we'll transfer the technology from here to the U.S. And uh, all those facilities will apply for ITAR over there, and once we have the addresses of those locations. So the, the process is going on. Paris Air Show was the trigger for us to move on. Uh, so we are in uh, extensive talks with several uh, U.S. states. Uh, to see uh, where we would set it up. So we hope that at least two will be set up this year and probably another two by early next year. Okay, you mentioned going to the Paris Air Show. You had a scale mock-up of the Hello 1X, I believe. Can you, what was that uh, event like? What was the feedback in industry response to you guys being there like? Um, I think uh, from, from Canada, ours was a large booth. Uh, we had our own booth. We, it's quite a bit of money to set up the booth, build the model. By the way, we build the model ourselves too. It's a 14 feet model um, and uh, we took it there and uh, we displayed it. So it's all about people seeing the product uh, instead, in, instead of we just show a video. So the, what we portrayed there was the Hello One. So that gave everyone an idea of how Hello One would look like. So I think a lot of people were intrigued. But I don't expect uh, any contracts to come out of that. It's basically more awareness. Uh, who we are, we exist. So that is where we, uh, that's the whole process of it. But I think uh, we started negotiations with a few companies who are interested in hypersonic, uh, mainly for defense areas. So I think uh, there is a potential. Defense is a huge industry. Exactly. Yeah. Um, looking at your demonstration flight, you talked about originally it was going to be sex bomb and now transitioning to the Hello 1X. Can you walk us through the strategy of the, the switch to this new vehicle? It's piloted, if I'm correct, the test flight. Uh, other than the uh, one that we were, the sex bomb that we were planning, to, we were planning to do from Lynn Lake, everything else is piloted with an unmanned option. Mm -hmm. So all our vehicles are piloted. And so basically, it's very, nothing unique in it. It's only the speed and the engines and, the, of course, the temperature, thermal management and other issues. But other than that, uh, it, the reason why we thought we'll do it is we could check stability, we could do all those tests instead of a wind tunnel test. So we did that on CFD now, and we're not even doing wind tunnel. Wind tunnel is a subsonic actual test in flight. So what does the road to the, uh, this first test flight now look like, making that transition to? What, what kind of milestones do we have to hit before we can see that actually um, occur? We are applying to FAA hopefully by next month, but it could move away by two or three months. Uh, we have, uh, we're already working. We've got some supersonic pilots on payroll in, in the U.S. right now working with us. So uh, they design all the cockpit and uh, life-sustaining systems over there in the U.S. And uh, that that will be implemented in the vehicle that we do right now. So the Hello 1X will prove stability of the vehicle. We reach Mark 5. All our air-breathing engines are working well. That means our turbo ramjet uh -huh. are working well. And then we get to see bite and kick the plane once it comes back and lands. But should something go wrong, it's got an ejection seat. Um, again, I tell you, we're built on failures. Right. So uh, no pilot is going to put himself or herself in the seat if they're not comfortable to do it. So getting that FAA approval, so we're putting the paperwork, we're trying to work with FAA. The moment we apply, we want to work with them in the final stages. So we're going to show them the wing test 
the failure of the wings test we did, any bursting pressure we did. Mm -hmm. So we are compiling everything together so we can apply with least number of questions, but least could be very long. <laughs> Working with the FAA is something <laughs> well aware of with the Starship, so okay. it's uh, quite the quite the process to get that approval. Once you have it, it's a, a quite a milestone. So we got uh, a few consultants help assisting us right now in the U.S. What's the process like of finding a, a pilot for that type of test? Is, is it pretty kind of common to find a, a test pilot in this, or is it a pretty special? Uh, it's basically check pilots or. Uh, we already have those pilots uh, on, on payroll right now, but we always looking for two more. So it could be someone could decide, no, nope, uh, because my spouse is not keen. Most of the guys that we have right now, actually all the guys we have now, are retired from defense, okay. who took early retirement from defense. They're not very old, but you know, they took early retirement, and as long as, and they're working with us right now. So they see what we are putting together and they're going to see all the test results. And uh, we will follow subsonic, supersonic, and then hypersonic. So it's actually building up the case to convince FA. FA is not give, going to give us a hypersonic flight. Uh, experiment. It's going to be experimental. We are not asking for operations, operator's license. We just want each time, we just want one, set of, one approval to fly. Mm -hmm. So we do a subsonic test with a chase plane then we know exactly what's happening. So only thing is that we cannot terminate it, the pilot has got to accept. So we we'll most likely go with the pilot. It's got an uh, unmanned option, mm -hmm. but I don't think we'll take the unmanned option. Uh, if the comfort level is there, actually with the pilot, it's a lot safer to get FAA approval right. because someone is in control. <laughs> Why is it so important to have an unmanned option with the one X, but also looking at one and two versus just always kind of going with a piloted version? Um, as it is, it's fly-by-wire anyways. So we're not making much of a change. Mm -hmm. So pilot is basically organizing it during the takeoff and subsonic. And afterwards, it's basically fly-by-wire. Okay. Yeah. Ultimately, the goal is to bring Hello 1 into um, online. Can you take us through a little bit of the idea of um, their unique capabilities. You talked about the lunar mission, but it looks like Martian mission, uh, Mars trend, uh, Mars ejection is possible, but also low Earth orbit. Why Why it's so important to have so many options of what you can do? Um, regarding Mars, is just a potential. But regarding Luna, it's very serious. Uh, that, that is the foundation of the company, right? right? So if we take Hello 1, uh, we can take anyone to suborbital, I think six plus two crew. Okay. to suborbital is, is what the number is, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, based on the weight. And then we can release 550 kilograms uh, payload, but it cannot be humans. It's got to be a satellite or something. And the Hello 1 uh, can only take humans to uh, suborbital. Mm -hmm. It cannot go to, uh, uh, cannot release a transfer vehicle because we need fuel to come back. So we, we, there is no space or weight that we can add to bring it back. So suborbital, uh, Hello One will take humans to suborbital and release a 550 kilograms to uh, Leo or Geo. Okay. Uh, and then it'll come back and land. So that's a transfer vehicle that is using a rocket engine and going up. Is that um, your own transfer vehicle? It's our own transfer yeah. vehicle, but oh. the rocket engine is not ours. Okay. The rocket engine is the only thing that we're gonna buy because there's so many proven rocket engines. Uh, available right now, but we want to make sure that it's proven, right? So that's all we have to make sure. And then, and not that's all, that's very critical because our whole path is gone if we fail because of the rocket engine. So that would explain what Hello 1 would do. And again, it's a cash flow thing. And Hello 2, which we'll be building as we build the Hello 1, we are not going to wait till the Hello 1 is tested and then build the Hello 2. We we'll start building the Hello 2, and that can put 5,500 kilograms to Leo or take 36 uh, passengers uh, to Leo. It's 5,500 kilograms. It's a huge number, right? It's a huge so that vehicle. Is, yeah, but you must understand the vehicle is actually coming back. It's a transfer vehicle that is going up, and then it's got to re enter and come back to the system. How do you navigate re entry? Basically, it's like a coffee mug again. So it's just ceramic tiles. Uh, we don't have any ablative thing planned right now. Uh, 
but we're using quite, uh, I don't want to say it's a coffee mug. Uh, it's as light as possible. It's a composite that we are working on right now. We are not ready yet, but you'll see the torch flames and all that shortly uh, published once we finish the test. Awesome. Reentry is always the big question, but yeah. I'm still processing the size of Hello 2. 36 people. It's a, yeah. it's a large vehicle. It is, it is, yeah. Are there restrictions then on the type of airports that you'd be able to? Yeah, Hello, Hello 2 will put us into a lot of restrictions okay. in terms of airport. But I think any 380 Airbus that can land should be able to do it. That, that is how we are looking. We are trying to look at ways what airports are available around the world, right? So we need a 10,000 feet uh, approximately runway length, mm -hmm. right? So you must understand all our, uh, our, including our afterburner, everything is switched on immediately when we take off. Uh, our angle of attack is almost like a fighter jet. Okay. It's not like a beautiful breeze uh, takeoff. But as far as the people are concerned, it's only, only the acceleration is what they'll feel just like any other plane and after that you walk on a plane right now to the washroom right mm -hmm. nothing happens it's still flying at 950 kilometers per hour compared to the ground mm -hmm. uh, that's what it is after but when you accelerate of course you feel more g's but right. otherwise it's just one g do we have an idea of what g's they are going to experience um we don't know exactly but our aim is to keep it uh, as minimal as possible but nothing, nothing more than a very simple fighter jet takeoff. Mm -hmm. Being the, I'm talking about the uh, larger vehicles. Right. Yeah. Thinking towards planes, you're mentioning 380s and stuff. The Hello 1 and then Hello 2, is there planes currently on the market you think roughly are the size kind of of a vehicle so we can picture? Oh, it'll be way, way smaller than any of those planes I yeah. mentioned, 380 or Boeing 777. Yeah. It'll be very small compared to that okay. because people are not sitting with... Uh, it's not a business class uh, situation, right. right? So it's mainly to see what's happening. You're going to Leo. Uh -huh. uh, it's a destination that we're hoping, and and this would the Hello Two would put 760 kilograms. That's a maximum we can do to the moon. Okay. But you don't have to wait uh, three months or two months to get there, uh, like people do the slingshot right now to go there. And if you look at uh, Indian Space Research yeah. Organization or uh, Ice space and all those. You see, they're using slingshots. We plan to go direct, and we're offering that to anyone who's looking at a lunar mission to work with us to send it directly, and you'll be there within a few days, mm -hmm. right? I mean, just like the the other missions to the moon. Right. So uh, our speed will almost be the same, and we're not planning on three months or two months, whatever the plan they have, yeah. uh, and use a slingshot and let the moon capture the gravity and take it there. So this, you'd know the success within three to four days. <laughs> no, absolutely. We're following Chandra on three right now. Yeah, okay. It's 42 days to get to the moon. Oh, is it? it's, a, okay. it's, a, it's a long time. Yeah. It's a lot of slingshots that have to go perfectly well to eject toward the moon and then a number to actually get captured. So yeah. hearing that you're going direct, it's obviously a lot of thrust that you need to do that right. correctly, but like, important. The, all you have to ask is why is it all these rocket companies cannot do it? It's because... They're overcoming the Earth's gravity using that rocket engine. They're throwing away the solid boosters. If you look at what point they're throwing away all the solid boosters, uh, you can see why. And uh, unfortunately, our scramjet is not ready. It's probably another three years away. Once our scramjet is ready, we can go up to 70 kilometers altitude instead of 32 kilometers altitude. And we'll have this high ISP. So it'll completely displace rockets uh, in the future. I mean, uh, if we don't displace rocket, we don't exist. Right. Yeah. What's the, obviously, well, uh, further down the line question, but the reusability versus refurbishability uh, and the turnaround time. Is this something that you land, you have a crane, put a new payload in, refuel and go? Or is it going to be, you need a period of time to refurbish vehicles because of the reentry and stuff? Um, as you see, this, the, the main vehicle is basically coming back and landing. Right. The other one uh, does not have uh, landing capabilities, uh, the one that transfer vehicle. That's going to come back like any other vehicle right now. So as far as the main vehicle is concerned, which is the Hello 1 or Hello 2, it's ready to use right away. But I don't want to say it's like a plane, right. basically because we have to figure out what is failing. 
So the planes over a period of time, they've looked at what has failed or about to fail. So we don't know what fatigue uh, materials would go through. So that is a learning curve that we have to go through. Anything I tell you right now, in theory, it looks perfect. You land, you fuel, and go. Right. It doesn't work like that. Because I'm expecting fatigue uh, in different materials. Uh, that will happen. So uh, we can do so many million cycles. Fatigue is critical. Um, and then talking about the uh, kind of the kick stage of the transfer vehicle, um, we're seeing some companies now looking at making those actually able to be kind of the satellite bus uh, for it. Is that something that you guys are considering as well? Is it more just a, a ride vehicle to deploy? So we, we would work with anyone. We, we are not a satellite company. I mean, uh -huh. like, uh, just imagine you call a trucking company right. and say, hey, I want to take this out there. But my size is this. I want you to make a fixture that will hold it uh, so it doesn't fall off. I want to put in extra stuff in. Can you add a small trailer to it? That's what we are. Uh -huh. So if they come back, with the proposal, we'll work with them to accommodate them. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, kind of the last couple of things to wrap up for us. Uh, what what can we expect this year? What's your kind of hopes and goals for the end of this year? And what can we kind of expect looking forward beyond that? Uh, this year, FAA applications completely goes in. We filed everything. We plan for launch from US next year. Okay. That is what uh, I don't want to say the time frame next right. year. Uh, but I think uh, if we get the approval, we could fly mid of next year. But then again, I, and we also f focus on Cornwall, UK, as we are setting up right over there. We're hiring people in Cornwall right now. We are advertised. And uh, we'll be applying to CA and uh, Department of Transport in, in the UK. We have had very early stage discussions with them. But we don't think that will materialize before we fly from the U.S., so U.S. is a focus. But you never know. Maybe Canada will come to us and say, hey, why don't you fly from here? And then we will apply here. But at this time, we have not applied in Canada again. Okay. We closed the other file some time ago. So, And then kind of long-term rough goals. You're saying three, four years out from the scramjet. When are you hoping to get Hello 1 or 2 maybe off the ground and operational? If we don't fly the Hello 2 by 2025, we'll be in dire straits. Uh, we must fly. Twin, by, hello too, I mean. So, uh, but having said that, uh, there's many a slip between the cup and the sip. Uh, but I'm focused uh, on uh, getting it going. So, but the, the most important thing is that the young engineers working here uh, are so pumped up. They really want to do this and really want to do this safe and fast. So I've got to give the credit to my team working here more than anything else. Absolutely. One of the questions we kind of ask everyone to wrap up our, our interviews is we're looking at this new commercial era of space exploration and vehicle development. Um, what would you say to those people that are looking at graduating, that are looking to get into the space industry or even just looking at their future and why space maybe should be part of that future they're considering? I would turn the question if you're looking at Canada, to the Canadian government, okay. and see how you, they can support existing companies mm -hmm. working in space today. I think the universities will all follow right away if you've got opportunities here. Look at us. Uh, instead of growing here, we are growing in the, going to grow in the U.S. Yeah. We would have become a 200 to 250 engineers company uh, if we had started growing here. Instead, we are moving to the U.S. Uh, to fly from the U.S., to get defense contracts in the U.S. So that is why we set up the U.S. company. So you can see the transition happening. So I would say it's something that I cannot do anything about, or none of those space companies can do anything about. I think it's got to come from the government uh, to support. And then the university will just follow. I mean, we got all the talents, but none of these guys getting his PhDs and masters and getting out of engineering colleges, they cannot go to the U.S. and work in a space company. They got to go there, work in the automotive industry, get their green card, and then apply to get in. But they don't have to do all that if we can do it here. But if you give us license to fly and work with us, uh, support, um, I mean, whether it's financial, technical, whatever it may be, 
uh, that would be great. I mean, that's one of the biggest things that we see. Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, I was going to say earlier, why Edmonton? Uh, it seems such a far-off place from, to start a rocket yeah. company. Yeah. You don't think of Canada when you think of rockets. So hopefully yeah. that's changing slowly. Yeah, I mean, Edmonton is because I'm in Edmonton. Uh, there's, uh, and I got a uh, uh, pump company uh, doing oil and gas uh, pumps and other stuff. Uh, worldwide mainly. I mean, that is also not being sold much in Canada, but mainly worldwide. And uh, that is why I'm in Edmonton. So uh, that gives us a lot of access uh, uh, to the experience that we've had in manufacturing, uh, design work, uh, buildings, land, and those kind of things. Right. And that's why we're in Edmonton. I can run all this in different countries. So U.S. will be run by a different team, but they all report to me. And uh, so will U.K., how did you first get interested in space? Um, uh, the answer may be so stupid, but uh, the answer is just stupidity. It's exactly that I can say. Because I was looking at all these rockets, people throwing away uh, rockets, and I used to wonder. Uh, and uh, I had worked with Russia in the past and been there several times. So I followed the Mars space station in uh, all the early days. But I don't have a history like people looking up the moon or anything like that. I don't have any of those good, good stories others say. I don't have those. I, I was probably uh, taking my car apart and putting it together, running it on multi-fuels and all that stuff. Uh, so would, would you take a plane and go to Munich and throw it away and then buy another plane and come back? That's the only reason. I mean, I was just trying to look at this and I thought, why not use a high ISP? But then again, being a young engineer, um, it, it, I tried to raise funds, and people thought, this guy is really crazy. So, I mean, I still sort of agree with them. <laughs> so, Getting into rocketry, I think there's a certain level. Yeah, that has I want to use the there. word uh, space instead of rocketry. Yep. What you're trying to replace is that first two stages of rock, which kills that whole rocket equation. Right. So had it not been for the rocket equation, we wouldn't survive. Right. The rocket equation, the delta V, is where you put more fuel, then you got a bigger vehicle. You put more fuel. I mean, I think uh, the Russian guy who wrote the rocket equation, he said it's just like you put a boat, put a whole bunch of stones, and you start throwing away the stones out, and gives you that force. And that's how he came out with the rocket equation. And that, that's how he explained it. So the courtesy goes to that guy, but had it not been for him to come out of the rocket equation, we could not have shown why ours is a lot better. So that's what we are. I mean, way better, lowest cost. Wow. Just thank you so much for okay. letting us come in and thank share you. more of your story. It's, uh, it's, there's not a lot known, and you guys are working on some really incredible stuff, so I appreciate your time. Um, anytime. You're welcome, and also thanks for having us.